webinars. Good afternoon. I'm Rachel Barnett. I'm the executive director of the Jewish Historical Society of South Carolina. And it's my pleasure to welcome all of you to this afternoon's webinar. But before we get started, I wanna recognize Gemma Birnbaum and Rebecca Miller with the American Jewish Historical Society and Jay Silverberg with the Southern Jewish Historical Society. Jay and I have been working together on the upcoming joint conference of the Southern and the South Carolina Society, which will be held in Charleston in two weeks. But when we learned of the passing of Eli Evans, we knew we wanted to pay tribute to this remarkable man. So we contacted Gemma and broached with the possibility of a webinar. She immediately jumped in, offered their marketing and technical support for today's program. So we're most grateful. Today's program, Poet Laureate of Southern Jews, Personal Remembrances of Eli Evans, is sponsored and supported by the American Jewish Historical Society, the Southern Jewish Historical Society, the Jewish Historical Society of South Carolina, the Goldring Waldenberg Institute of Southern Jewish Life, and the Covenant Foundation. I would say that this is a powerhouse of organizations who have come together to pay tribute to Eli Evans and his major contributions to Southern Jewish history. Eli was the keynote speaker at the first meeting of the South Carolina Society in April of 1994 that was held at the College of Charleston. Senator Isidore Lurie envisioned establishing an organization that would study, promote, and preserve the history of South Carolina's Jewish community. He knew the small town Jewish life he had experienced growing up was rapidly disappearing. In his remarks at that meeting, Eli said, every newcomer to the South, whether it be to Charleston or Atlanta or wherever, has to encounter Southern history, has to encounter Southern customs, has to encounter the South. He continued, but it's great to be back in the home state of Je Judah P. Benjamin and Isidore Lurie, two great political figures in South Carolina's history. Mm -hmm. 30 years later, the Jewish Historical Society of South Carolina has realized Isidore's vision. He has been, he was a guest speaker at society meetings over the years. I have counted at least five times. He joined us as either a moderator, a panelist or a keynote address. And we are most grateful to his support that he gave to the society over the many years. My own encounter with the provincials in 1973 led to a light bulb moment. I was a junior in high school in a small town, Somerton, South Carolina. We were the only Jews in town. My dad was a town pharmacist and my mother was a high school history teacher. We drove 22 miles to attend synagogue in Sumter, South Carolina at Temple Sinai. I related to Eli's story and realized my experiences weren't unusual and I was hooked on Southern Jewish history from that moment on. So now it is my pleasure to turn this over to our moderator, Robert Rosen. Robert is a shareholder in the Rosen Law Firm in Charleston. He received his BA degree history in Morning, history Robert. from the University of Virginia in 1969, his master's in history from Harvard in 1970, and his JD degree in, from the University of South Carolina School of Law in 73. He's the author of A Short History of Charleston, Confederate Charleston, and Illustrated History of the City and the People During the Civil War, and the Jewish Confederates, all published by University of South Carolina Press. Additionally, and, and most importantly, <laughs> Robert, Robert and Judge Richard Gurgle, each past presidents of the society, stepped up when we were all locked down during the pandemic but by providing an amazing Zoom program monthly with their special guests and amazing topics. All 21 episodes of these programs can be found on our website at jhssc.org. Now, today's program is being recorded. Should you have questions, please put them in the chat box and let me welcome Robert and all of our special guests. Thank, Thank you. you. Rachel, thank you so much. It's a, a great honor um, to be able to moderate this program. Eli Evans, as probably all of you know, was born in Durham, North Carolina, 1936, the son of Emmanuel Mutt Evans and Sarah Nachemson Evans, 
His father was a merchant, active in politics, serving as mayor of Durham, the first Jewish mayor of Durham, for six terms, 1951 to 1963. His mother and grandmother were extremely active in Hadassah and Zionist organizations. Eli graduated from UNC Chapel Hill in 1958, was the first Jewish president of the student body. He served in the U.S. Navy for two years, graduated from Yale Law School in 1963, and was a speechwriter for Lyndon Johnson in the 1960s. He went to work for the Carnegie Foundation and then served as president of the Charles Revson Foundation in 1977. He was married to Judith London in 1981, they had one son, Joshua, who's with us today. Eli was friends with the famous editor of Harper's, Willie Morris, um, who convinced him to write about Southern Jews. In 1973, he pu published The Provincials, which most of you have read, undoubtedly, a memoir, a history, and a travelogue, which became a bestseller among Jewish Americans and Southerners. It is an iconic book, which is credited with founding the discipline of Southern Jewish history. Uh, we all read it. We were all inspired by it. Uh, Willie Morris called it an enduring classic. Later, Eli wrote a modern biography of Judah Benjamin, the, Jew the Jewish Confederate, the Secretary of State of the Confederacy. He also wrote The Lonely Days Were Sunday, Reflections of a Jewish Southerner, a collection of essays, including his travels with Henry Kissinger and, and also about Zionism. The Jews of the South have found that poet laureate. Abba Iban said uh, in a blurb of, uh, of Eli's book. Eli, as you will hear, was generous with his time and eloquence in supporting numerous Jewish organizations. He helped to found the Southern Jewish Historical Society, the Carolina Center for Jewish Studies at UNC, and as you just heard, and he was uh, very helpful in founding our own South Carolina Society. He died July 26, 2022. We're here today to honor and remember Eli Evans, the patron saint of Southern Jewish history. Our panel consists of Marcy Cohen Ferris, who's a professor emeritus in the Department of American Studies at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Her research and teaching interests include Southern history and culture, particularly the foodways and material culture of the American South. She's the author of Matzo Ball Gumbo, Culinary Tales of the Jewish South and the Edible South. Josh Evans is Eli's son, a, a SAG-AFTRA actor with multiple television and film credits to his name. Um, his work can be seen on joshlevans.com. I'll repeat that, joshlevans.com. Little, little plug there for Josh. Um, Macy Hart is with us. Somehow he graduated from the University of Texas. I'm not sure how he came from Winona, Mississippi. He's the founder and president emeritus of the Goldring Woldenberg Institute of Southern Jewish Life, a longtime director of the Henry S. Jacobs Camp in Utica, Mississippi. He, he virtually established the Museum of the Southern Jewish Experience and was called the maestro of the Southern Jewish Experience by Southern Jewish Life. Len Rogoff is the former president of Southern Jewish Historical Society. He's written and lectured on the Jewish history of North Carolina. He's now a historian for the Jewish Heritage Program, Jewish Heritage North Carolina. He's a PhD from UNC, taught at NC Central, was the author of Homeland, Southern Jewish Identity in Durham and Chapel Hill, and a biography of Gertrude Weil, Jewish progressive in the New South. And last but not least, Stephen Whitfield is Max Richter, Professor Emeritus of American Civilization at Brandeis University. He is a nationally renowned historian. He's written 11 books, including Learning on the Left, Political Profiles of Brandeis University, In Search of American Jewish Culture, and The Voices of Jacob, Hands of Esau, Jews in American Life and Thought. So we have quite a panel. And unfortunately, we, we don't have but so long to let people speak. So I'm going to call on Marcy to start start us out with um, some remembrances of Eli Evans. All right. Thank you, Robert. Um, I'm so delighted to be with y'all. First, I want to thank Robert, of course, a great scholar of the Jewish South and of South Carolina, who I've called upon his work and included it in my own. Rachel, Gemma, and Jay, so honored to be a part of this and just delighted to be with my Southern Jewish family on, on this panel who have 
guided me and helped me and encouraged me along the way. Josh, it means the world to have you here. I want to start off with some college memories, and it reminds me of what Rachel was saying to us, too, about that kind of first encounter that we probably have all had with the provincials. Uh, I was uh, in a folklore course that I was enrolled in as a senior at Brown University in the late 1970s, and the final assignment was to write about your folk group, and uh, I figured mine was Arkansas Jews, so we each... <laughs> had to bring a representative dish to the class potluck dinner at the end of the semester. Of course, I, I brought Shabbat fried chicken that I fried up in my little apartment. And I'll never forget that moment when I was doing research that semester and finding the kind of recently published the provincials in the library stacks that semester. Like Rachel and others, it became my doorway into the study of the Jewish South, including its food ways. because. You know, Eli really understood food and he talked about it. He recognized it. He saw those worlds. But for the next 40 years, Eli was really my inspiration, a mentor, a teacher, a friend, a guest lecturer, uh, and in the field of Southern Jewish history and culture. I was honored to work with Eli at the Museum of the Southern Jewish Experience with Macy in Jackson, Mississippi in the 1990s. We visited the state's historic synagogues from Greenville to Natchez together. I soon was introduced to the magnificent Judith London Evans and each year received their holiday card that featured a growing Josh and Zelda there Westie and I have a little <laughs> evidence of that right here. And um, when Bill and I came to Chapel Hill to teach at the University of North Carolina, I again worked with Eli. A Jewish study center had been proposed in the College of Arts and Sciences thanks to the vision of UNC development officer, Sam McGill, inspired by his beloved Carolina Blue, the Tar Hills, his hometown of Durham, his family's Jewish legacy in this state and in the region. Eli stepped in to lead the effort as our founding chair. It was a great privilege to work with Eli, the other board members, and UNC professor Jonathan Hess, a dear friend of blessed memory as we launched the Carolina Center for Jewish Studies in 2003 and had a fundraising event for the center in New York City, uh, UNC Chancellor James Meeser, former Chancellor James Meeser said, you cannot have a world-class university without a Jewish studies program. So today in large part due to the passionate support of Eli Evans, there are 110 Jewish studies courses on the books at Carolina, a strong network of graduate student support is in place. More than 23 affiliate faculty members teach in 11 different academic departments and some 1,000 Jewish, uh, some 1,000 students, not just Jewish students, take Jewish studies courses each year. In addition to that academic program and research and teaching support for faculty and students, the Carolina Center for Jewish Studies sponsors lectures and discussions and symposia. And supporters were always inspired by Eli's leadership, by his commitment to an expansive, inclusive, and progressive University of North Carolina. And he worked for that from his election, as Robert mentioned, as the first student, first Jewish student body president at Carolina, really to the end of his life. And in 2005, the University of North Carolina Press Mark the 350th anniversary of Jews coming to America by republishing a new edition of the Provincials. And I'll just close with one more quick memory. Eli always spoke in my Southern Jewish History seminar each fall on a date that of course coincided with a Carolina home football game. He arrived in class wearing his Carolina baseball cap. He, um, each year I assigned my students the Provincials uh, and they wrote a critical essay about it. And I, I still am. And I'm hoping that Josh will take Eli's place in coming to visit my students. Everyone sat mesmerized as Eli would weave these incredible stories and narratives of his Jewish Southern experience that was integrated like the provincials into the region's history. He always pushed students to understand the power of their own lives as change makers and leaders. And at the end of the class, he continued to chat with students until I said, they have to go. They're going to be late for class, Eli. <laughs> and then without prompting, the class stood 
gave him a standing ovation and they lined up to have their copies of the provincials autographed and their photograph made with Eli. And once when Josh, when we were so privileged to have Josh join us and after class, as we walked through campus towards the Carolina Inn, Eli would always be nervous and ask, how did I do? Was it okay? And I answered, it was more than okay. It was life-changing. And it really was. I could really see it in the experience of my students every year of students that I have long since graduated who still remember those classes and the powerful experience of the honor of meeting Eli and of, of understanding his experience as a student at Carolina, you know, in the late 50s. So I'll stop there, but thank you all thank you, for letting thank me you, share Martha. that. Thank you so much. Len Rogoff. Tell us about Eli Evans. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Once again, uh, I'll echo Marcy's uh, comment. It's both uh, it's such an honor to be, uh, to, to honor Eli and also to have such colleagues here to recall their uh, memories of him. Uh, I came to Chapel Hill in 1967 as a graduate student in English literature. Uh, Southern Jews were just a curiosity to me then. I, I had students in my freshman English class uh, with Southern accents and names like Kittner and Blumenfeld. Uh, I knew downtown on Franklin Street was Berman's department store. And I had a Long Island friend named Goldstein who went shopping in Durham and came back charmed after having bought jeans at Gladstein's. Uh, like many, the Provincials was my introduction to Southern Jewish history. And like many of us, whetted my, my interest and led me into an unanticipated career as a Southern Jewish historian. Uh, Eli had created a narrative of Southern Jewish history. The South, he often observed, was a storytelling place. And he elegantly and graphically evoked Southern Jewish life and peopled it with memorable characters. Uh, the Provincials itself is really an artifact of Southern Jewish history. And it's remarkable that it's still in print after 50 years. Uh, and uh, has gone through three editions. Uh, having just read the Provincials for at least the third time, I think, uh, I, uh, I, I, found, um, I found it to be more of a memoir and less of a history than I had remembered. I think I was conflating uh, my memories of the Provincials with the Judah Benjamin and the, uh, the Lonely Days Were Sundays, but the subtitle of the Provincials is A Personal History, and indeed Family Pride was his guide, uh, which was entirely uh, both understandable and justifiable considering his parents and his own remarkable achievements. He would insist both that his story was, was but one, one of many of the Jewish South and that there was a unique Southern Jewish identity. Inspired and measured by the provincials, I embarked on my own history research of Durham, Chapel Hill, and later North Carolina Jews, not as memoir, but by blending oral history and community folklore with, uh, with documentary research. Um, Eli's interest was in the rootedness of Southern Jews as provincials in telling their story, whereas I saw them as cosmopolitans rooted in the South as Eli described them, but also as mobile multiculturalists claiming many homelands. In the forward to the Lonely Days Were Sunday, former North Carolina Governor and Senator Terry Sanford uh, described Eli as quote, being at home in many worlds. Uh, he reveled in being a small town Southerner, but he was also at home in the national politics of Washington and true to his mother's legacy in Israel. In that sense, Eli embraced the complexities and contradictions of Southern Jews. As many others will tell you, Eli was always encouraging and enthusiastic to see others take up his challenge of telling the story. Uh, after the provincials came a torrent of Southern Jewish memoirs, community histories, uh, and Southern Jewish travelogues with names like wandering Jews or bagels and grits. Imitation is, after all, the sincerest form of flattery. He wrote a forward to one of my uh, community histories that was so effusive and so complimentary that I feel embarrassed reading it. Uh, <laughs> with his usual poetry, he inscribed one book to me as, quote, a fellow laborer in the vineyard of Southern Jewish history. Uh, I picture him now with a UNC cap. Other than Carolina basketball, um, our Southern Jewish history schmoozes were often preceded by his re reassuring my anxieties that the Tar Heels would be just fine this year at point guard. Uh, the Jewish South was his passion. 
And beyond his writing, he was inspirational in creating and supporting the institutions that would maintain Southern Jewish life and tell its story. Uh, Jewish studies now proliferate on university campuses, scholarship abounds, and Southern courses in Southern Jewish history like Marcy's have uh, entered the canon. Uh, Eli, with his energy, enthusiasm, resources, and connections, was the entrepreneur of Southern Jewry. When we embarked on our own multimedia project, Down Home Jewish Life in North Carolina, he not only provided material support, but became a spokesperson. Uh, Marcy has spoken of, what he, of his leadership in creating the Carolina Center for Jewish Studies. As we all know, uh, Eli was, re, was instrumental in the revival of the Southern Jewish Historical Society. Uh, those of us who are members often express our fondness for the organization for its congeniality and welcoming spirit. Uh, at its refounding, uh, Eli was insistent that the SJS bring together lay people and academics into a shared community. Uh, it's that ambience of Jewish warmth and Southern hospitality that draws us together even today. And for that, we owe much uh, to the character of Eli Evans. Thank you. Good. Lynn, thank you so much. Steve, can you share your uh, recollections of Eli? Uh, sure, I'd be happy to, Robert. Thank you again for this um, uh, wonderful <laughs> invitation and opportunity to participate in uh, paying tribute to Eli. My situation is a little bit different in that I, although I also was very much inspired by reading The Provincials roughly when it came out in 1973, uh, and although it's also true, as with Len and with Marcy, that my own professional career was altered uh, in important ways by the inspiration that uh, Eli provided, I had the chance to meet him only three years after the book was published because uh, I participated in the founding organization or perhaps <clears throat> reorganization of the Southern Jewish Historical Society held in Richmond in 1976, and therefore was uh, a little bit stunned to realize that the author of The Provincials is also a terrific speaker, an eloquent, articulate orator, uh, somebody who, um, uh, through his uh, platform uh, style, as well as his prose in writing, uh, really gave dignity to this very subject. Before Eli Evans, I had no particular idea that Southern Jewish history could be anything but a random collection of memories and uh, uh, a certain sense of uh, limited scholarly interest. But Eli really created this particular field or subfield. And he did so not only by the in the various ways that Marcy and Len have already described, <clears throat> that is entrepreneurial, institutional, uh, in that sense, a, a remarkable fi figure in really creating the, uh, the network of Southern Jewish studies, but also because of his ideas. And it's pretty rare to remember uh, um, nearly half a century later things that a speaker has articulated. But I remember two things in particular from Eli's keynote address in Richmond. One was um, his description of how interested he was when he was traveling through the South to figure out how Jews somehow ended up in these small towns and hamlets, often barely recognizable on a map, certainly not widely known to outsiders. <laughs> and uh, he brought the house down by describing his account of meeting somebody actually in uh, a small town in North Carolina who explained to Eli why he had landed there, why he'd ended up there and founded a business. And he told Eli, it's because the horse died. <laughs> that line has been resonating in all sorts of ways. It has a certain aptitude uh, for all sorts of understanding of how small town Jewry existed. The other striking statement that Eli made on that occasion, <clears throat> which I believe is probably the most a uh, reverberant statement sentence that has ever been uttered about so the Southern Jewish experience is when Eli said that the story of Southern Jews is the story of the fathers who built businesses for the sons who didn't want them. Now, this obviously has an obvious personal echo 
That obviously is a story of Eli Evans himself, the son of Emmanuel Mutt Evans. Um, but it is also something that uh, indicates, it seems to me, something about the very marrow of Southern Jewish life, which was its orientation toward business, toward mercantile interests, the ways in which, in ways unlike uh, elsewhere in the United States, where there was a power, often a powerful Jewish labor movement, uh, unlike other uh, urban areas in some ways outside the South, this was an area in which uh, uh, family businesses existed and were presumably to be perpetuated, often to the disappointment of their founders. The statement is still, still seems to me worth considering, even though obviously in our uh, gender sensitivity, it excludes half of the population of Southern Jews. Uh, it is also possible that Eli had overstated the degree to which uh, the story of Southern Jews is the story of men who built businesses for sons who didn't want them. Nevertheless, I can't come up with a better single sentence that somehow summarizes what the J Southern Jewish experience is all about. I can't come up with a sentence that better encapsulates its distinctiveness, its singularity, its meaning. And for that, as a, as a student of Southern Jewish history, I'm extremely grateful to Eli. Uh, we've known each other on a number of, met each other on a number of occasions, not only at conferences, also when he spoke at Brandeis, also when he spoke at the, uh, when the American Jewish Historical Society was on the Brandeis campus and he spoke about his book on Judah P. Benjamin. But I will never forget that initial meeting and the degree to which the wonderfully creative and gifted author of the Provincials is the very same person whom I met in Richmond in 76. Steve, thank you very much. Thank you. Macy, where are you? <laughs> <On the moon. laughs> you? You had a lot of interaction with uh, Eli Evans. You, you must have dragged him to some pretty remote places in Mississippi. Maybe you can tell us about it. <laughs> You got your you. You got to turn on your. How about now? Now you now you got it. Okay. Good. <clears throat> I explained uh, to the audience you were from Mississippi, so the expectations are pretty low. Thank you so much um, <laughs> for that, Robert. Uh, you you lowered yourself to come there once <laughs> yourself and do a book <laughs> for me for the. Um, I um I think you were. Uh, Stephen, I think you were wrong about one thing when you said because of gender, gender sensitivity that we left out all about half. It, my understanding was is 100% of the bosses were left out <laughs> because the bosses were all the females to begin with that just let us do our thing. So anyway, I had some extraordinary experiences um, with uh, Eli. Uh, some unbelievable ones, the comings and the goings, my uh, going to New York on a regular basis to try to recruit um, people to come to Mississippi, either move there or work there in the various organizations. I'm proud that the Institute of Southern Jewish Life is one of the sponsors today of this program. I have a great affinity to that, and Eli also had a a lovely interest in it. But I think what I want to share with y'all is the is the moment in time where I was, and I used to drop into Eli's office on a regular basis when I was in New York, and he was never too busy. Um, one time I dropped in late, and he fell asleep while we were talking a couple of times, but he didn't miss a beat um, in the conversation. But here's the main thing about, he said to me once, you know, um, um, Willie Morris, you know, really uh, discovered me or claimed to discover me. And I was just writing speeches, he said, in the, in the White House for two different presidents. And people kept saying, you gotta meet Willie Morris, you gotta meet Willie Morris. So we went to meet Willie Morris. It was supposed to be a, really an afternoon thing. It lasted all night and next into the day. And from that, Eli started his uh, real writing. Um, and if I'm correct, 
that kind of gave rise to the provincials. I think it had been in his head for a while. So fast forward, um, Eli and I were in a conversation. He said, you know what would be a great panel? I said, what? He said, why don't we get Willie? Because he knew all these are authors by the first name. Why don't we get Willie? And, and I knew Willie because he's from Mississippi, University of Texas. I'm University of Texas. So why don't we get Willie and we'll do a thing and we'll talk about Judah Benjamin. And I said, it's a great idea. So I took the idea home, got in touch with, uh, with uh, Governor William Winter, asked him if he would moderate a panel for me to have Eli and Willie Morris together on a panel in the old Capitol um, Senate room or house room where we seceded from the union. Um, and Willie, by the way, was either the great, great nephew or the great, uh, great, great grandson of Henry Foote, the terrible governor who seceded. Fast forward, um, Eli said, now we're going to go to dinner the night before because that's what we would have done. So it was my wife, Susan, myself, Eli and Willie. And Eli called me and said, now you got to get at least a half a gallon or more of Jack Daniels to bring to the dinner because Willie will go through the whole thing. <laughs> so I do that and Susan and I are just regaled with the conversation going on between Willie and Eli about Willie Styron, Jimmy Bressler, uh, Bressler, all these artists. And Susan and I were feeling we were just in the middle of history that we were um, allowed to be eavesdroppers. The thing about Eli, from, from my point of view, he was always one who would be willing to promote the Southern experience. I took poetic license and anytime I wrote anything about the Southern Jewish experience, I capitalized Southern Jewish and experience. Mm -hmm. So people would know that that was a proper name and it deserved that. And a lot of it came from the way Eli embraced it. But the way Eli was embraced, I put him on two uh, maybe three book tours um, to these little small towns where nobody serves. It was the large uh, towns that would say, if you want it, come get it. But you know, these small towns fed all these larger communities and Eli knew that. Um, and I think the title of Poet Laureate of the, of the South is, is so uh, well said in the sense that when he spoke, Everybody listened. His use of language, his tonality, all of his uh, emphasis, as we call it, on the syllables was just um, so masterful. I loved my time with him, um, and it carried on all the way into the covenant time period. Um, and never he, he lost interest. By the way, and then I'll close, um, I tried for um, eight or 10 years to get Eli to go on my board at the Museum of the Southern Jewish Experience. Um, and finally, I turned on him and I contacted Margaret Ann Goldsmith, who lives in, Hella, uh, in uh, Huntsville, Alabama. She was on our board and she and Eli had developed a relationship with exchanging uh, some extraordinarily important papers on history. She, uh, she got a hold of him in New York and he changed his mind and called me and said, okay, uh, I'll go on your board. And he did. And he was such a prize for us. Great affection for him. Uh, Josh, um, you have um, a lovely legacy, but you are, you are you and you could be the son who didn't do what the father did, but what you're doing is great. And, um, and I want everybody to know that the reason I have this backdrop on this Zoom call is because I have said since the moment I got invited to this, I'm in high cotton to be with this group of people. And so therefore I'm sitting on top of the world. Thank you, Robert.
<laughs> Macy, thank you so much. Josh, would uh, you like to share some thoughts with us? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, the you know uh, the perspective that I'm here to bring today is just about the role uh, of my father that that. Uh, he had in my life, and you know, to to some some of you may have called him Mr. Evans, or some of you knew him as Eli. And to my family, uh, he was known as Uncle E. Um, and before he went into the Navy, right after undergrad at at UNC, people called him Sonny. But you know, to me, he was just Dad. I mean, he was loving and supportive, and always encouraging me to keep going and to push through adversity. And my father passed down to me a, a family mantra that came from his father, Mutt, which was Evans's never quit. Now we would procrastinate, but we would not quit. And so as some of you know, my father loved working late into the night whenever there was a pending deadline. I mean, he thrived on that energy and that pressure and it brought out his creativity. And that creativity sparked these connections. And it was through those connections with others where he found the most joy. And as I've thought back about my dad and push past the more recent memories of his illness, I find myself smiling because all of my memories of him involve joy. He was such a joyous and loving person, so warm and full of charm. And I, I didn't really realize it until after he passed, but that was really his superpower his charm. I mean, my, my dad could and would talk to anyone. <laughs> and there would come a point in during the conversation where you would feel as if you and him were the only two people on earth. And he had this way of being completely engaged with you and your ideas that made you feel special. Now, I, I must admit that as a child, this superpower of his embarrassed me. You know, teenage Josh did not approve of Eli the social butterfly. <laughs> However, as I have grown older, I have come to recognize just a small hint of this trait in myself, and I could not be more proud to carry that part of him with me forever. Um, just to finalize my remarks, I just want to say thank you uh, to all of our hosts today, the Institute of Southern Jewish Life, Jewish Historical Society of South Carolina, the Southern Jewish Historical Society, the American Jewish Historical Society, and the Covenant Foundation. Thank you for all the support of my father over these many, many years. I know that he valued your work and the gifts of education that you bring to the masses. I, I also just want to thank my fellow panelists. Thank you all for the collaboration and the work that you've shared with my father over all the years, and, and thank you for sharing your time today. You know, we we Jews, we say about those who have passed, may their memory be a blessing. And so hearing the memories today about my father are, are truly a blessing for me. So thank you. I, I will treasure this for a very long time. And then to everybody attending today, thank you. You know, my dad would be so happy to see the turnout today and knowing that all of those years of sending holiday cards, some, some years as late as February or March, uh, have come back to us with love today. <laughs> so thank you all. I really, really appreciate this. Josh, we really appreciate your being here. Um, can you tell us the story about your grandfather? Uh, how, how how the Evans family got to Durham? Well, so I, I uh, yeah, Robert, I think, I, I mean, I think the story that um, I'm thinking about what you're thinking of is, uh, is about actually my great grandfather, great grandfather, uh, yeah, right, Eli, right, right, Eli Nackamson, who was my father's yeah. namesake. I mean, you know, look, this is all family lore. That's <laughs> I mean, okay. Everybody in this audience loves it, loves to hear. Well, so, the, I mean, the story as I know it was that, um, my great grandfather Eli was, uh, you know, a peddler taking the train through the south and. Um, it stopped in Durham, North Carolina, because there was a fire and this desire to kuno lum repair the world, you know, came over him and he got off the train and the train left. And so that we got off the train to help stop the fire. And that was how we ended up there. But, um, you know, my I father always story. spoke of Durham, especially as home. And although you know, by the time that he died this year, he had spent more of his life outside of North Carolina than he had in the state. Um, it felt very fitting for him to be buried in Durham and go home in yeah. that sense. 
So it was, yeah, he to was him, a, the South was always home. It was Well, he, he was poetic, and he was also a, a romantic about the South. He just loved the South. Yeah. Um, you, do you remember the story about um, when he was running for mayor that he told about uh, his father, uh, Eli's father, Mutt? He, he put on his campaign posters that he'd been president of the synagogue. You know that? Yeah, well, my dad tell, always told me. Tell everyone that story. I love yeah, that story. So my, my, <laughs> My uh, my my grandfather, you know, look back in the fifties, right? There, there, the right. Um, open anti-Semitism existed in a, in a little bit of a different way than it does now. And you know, my uh, my father recalled the story of putting that information about being a Jew on on the, on his campaign posters and the worry that was there because of potential backlash. And my grandfather said. Down in the South, they respect church work. <laughs> it didn't necessarily matter what the church was. Just right. If you were religious, there right. was respect there. Well, uh, that was the that was the talent that Eli Evans had. He had the he had the talent to bring together sort of the 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 positive parts of the South with maybe some of the negative parts and try to try to see it in the best maybe the best possible light. Maybe that's. Maybe that's the way I'm looking at it. So let me talk to the panel for a minute and we'll take some questions from the audience. Um, can each of you uh, respond to this question? Is the provincial still worth reading? In other words, he, he wrote a book in 1973 that is 50 years old. He's talking about Saul, you know, old man Blot, who was the speaker of the house you know, it was a rabid segregationist. He was talking about the the problems of desegregation. I mean, he's talking about things that are 50 years ago. So is there, what is the, what are the pluses and minuses of assigning the provincials and uh, to students and to for Jewish readers to read it today? And you can be brutally honest. <laughs> I think the book, I think the book is relevant because here we are 50 years later and we still endure a whole bunch of those things mm -hmm. uh, that were mentioned and there are still rabid rabid uh, anti-semites out there and there's uh, there's this awakening that took place in my opinion after the 67 war where we now will make waves we will talk about if we're going to play, if we're going to pray in public, it needs to be inclusive. Those things that we used to hide and just don't make waves. That was the attitude throughout the deep South. Um, and I think the book's very relevant. And especially if you read further, so many other things that have come out that would be um, <clears throat> relevant to today that are current, that have a mention of things that are past. Marcy, are you still assigning the book? Are they still using the book at Chapel Hill? Oh, ab absolutely. I mean, I hope to teach my Southern Jewish seminar again in the fall, and it's already on my reading list. I mean, of course, it's incredibly relevant for students to read about Eli, who kept diaries of his experience at the University of North Carolina, and and the all of his experience that he had here, you know, and but I ask my students, and I think most most scholars would today, you know, to to be critical about the text as well. You know, there when they write an essay on it, you know, their assignment is to look for for them to just personally identify are there absences that they see, mm -hmm. you know, that perhaps counter, you know, he. Eli celebrated the Jewish South and, and often, you know, that's difficult, you know, today, you know, we critique the American South in all of its complexities. He, of course, realized those he saw them. And there are many of, of the of the of the problem South, the difficult South, the the the, you know, the nightmare South are in uh, the provincials and students get that they see it, but they also they understand when he was writing. I think Len did a great job of kind of contextualizing when Eli was writing the provincials. And of course, this is really important time to read about in the 70s. And we all are experiencing these kind of full, full circle moments today, of course. So it's like, you know, if we we are in this very long 
civil rights movement today as we look at Black Lives Matter and we we see you know where where we are today in this nation. Um, so it's absolutely absolutely relevant, and I I I will continue to you know to to find you know very powerful you know experiences within within this text, um, and also I look forward to. You know, Sherry Rabin is working on a really great new history, uh, an important history of the Jewish South. She's talked quite a bit about her work also helps to situate what was happening in the 70s in the in the Jewish South. Uh, she's got a really great um, discussion in a, a new book that's coming out on the Jewish South that looks at a letter between Macy and Eli in the late 80s when they were discussing the founding of the Museum of the Southern Jewish Experience. And Eli had incredibly interesting things to say about what he thought that museum could be. So those kinds of archival materials too are really, um, they're so important. They're gonna be central to, uh, to continuing to study the, Amer the Jewish South. Steve, what's the, what is the place of the provincials in Southern history today, in your view? Uh, I'm not sure that I could answer that question uh, definitively, but I would say that in terms of my own reading, it's still the single best, certainly the best single best introduction to the subject. Uh, and I mean no disrespect to the work of uh, my fellow panelists to say it's certainly the book that I think draws readers into the the whole field in a way that no other book can and i think it does so because eli's gifts as is suggested by the very word poet eli's gifts were primarily uh literary mm -hmm. uh his, his gifts were primarily a, that of a writer and what he's able to do in a way that formal historical scholarship can't do is really connect the personal with the broader themes and the broader topics what Eli does so well in the provincials is really to connect his own experiences, his own sensibility, his own memories, his own family into a, a remarkably rich uh, tapestry that goes beyond it mm -hmm. and that draws upon the work of other scholars and other scholars will in various ways supersede what he's done, mm -hmm. but nobody has yet really topped it. Lynn? Is uh, yeah, just to reiterate what Marcy and Steve has said, um, Marcy's always emphasizing the need. Uh, I, I think the, the provincials is worth reading as a narrative history, uh, as, as a work of literature. And again, I'd always emphasize its uh, subtitle is a personal history. And Marcy's always uh, put the stress on the, what it does convey is the felt experience of what, it, what it, uh, of, of living as a Jew in, in the South. Uh, one person's perspective and one person's experience. When I went into the documentary records, though, I often found that the community folklore and the community memory that that Eli was reported needed to be tested against the documentary record. For example, he tells a wonderful story about the cigarette rollers who came and worked for the Duke Tobacco Factory and describes them as the founders of the uh, Jewish community of Durham and and how how the history of the Durham Jews was tied to the rise of Duke and the tobacco industry. But then when I looked at newspapers and, and census records, uh, I started to see, well, ads for stores and, and names like Goldstein and Mosberg and uh, Nachman and Levy in the 1870s, well before the cigarette ride rollers arrived. And it's that kind of tension that you see between the, the folkloric history the, the, the folklore and the documentary history, where it really gets interesting in terms of what Eli heard and what he reported and what his experiences were. Uh, so I, I do think that the uh, the provincials holds up well uh, in terms of conveying the experience, but I do think uh, there's been such a, uh, uh, that, the, that the, the, the historiography and the scholarship has really expanded beyond it. By the way, I, I noticed it might interest you, Robert. Uh, I was just looking because I, I recently reread the 2005 edition of the Provincials, and he leaves out the story of Saul Black. Oh, is that he, right? He, 
he appears yeah. in the in, in the 1973 first edition, but not in the third. <laughs> yeah, you know, I kept well, looking for it because I a, remembered it. So again, it, he was aware of an evolving South. Yeah. You, well, you know, when I went back and looked at the provincials, um, I was um, I was well. I don't know what the word the proper word is. Uh, a, a little shocked, a little dismayed by the rawness of it. In other words, it was good reporting. In other words, uh, Blot uh, was the longest serving speaker of any House of Representatives in the United States who was Jewish. His parents were immigrants. He was raised as a Jew, but he he sort of never identified as being Jewish. And he, you know, and that chapter that Eli wrote was brutal. I mean, to to modern, to our sensibilities, it really is very unpleasant reading. But on the other hand, I think the book itself and I think Marcy said this, you said this, Steve said this, the book itself is an artifact. In other words, the book itself is reporting from the 1970s. Um, and, um, you know, of course, the, the thing about, about the provincials, and I, I went, when I went back and I read about the Tobias family, you know, Eli had a way of talking in a romant, romantic, not romanticized, but a, a very poetic way of talking and you know you know when he left uh thomas jefferson tobias ninth generation charlestonian at his house in charleston he said he stood on the front veranda of his house rumpled and alone waving as i drove away the wind from the charleston waterfront blowing slightly to ripple the air on a desperately hot august day two weeks later he was dead Thomas Jefferson Tobias was buried in the Cumming Street Cemetery in the Tobias family plot. I mean, the writing is just, you know, let's face it, most historians just can't do it. Um, so, uh, it, you know, so, you know, for that, for the writing alone, I think the book survived. Um, so the, the powers that be on this telecast, do we have questions from the audience? Um, we are uh, running on time. Um, Rachel, are you there? The masters of the universe who control this program? We have uh, one question from someone <laughs> who asked, did he continue to play the ukulele throughout his life? Um, <laughs> she remembers riding buses to young Judea conventions in Daytona Beach with Sonny, Eli, playing and singing. I got tears in my eyes from lying on my back while I cried over you. Josh? Yeah, I mean, he did. He played the ukulele and the banjo my whole life um, and uh, and even, you know, inspired um, inspired his, uh, you know, one of his nephews to take up to take up the guitar. And um, we would play songs at our Passover Seder that my father would would bring down the banjo. I mean, I remember as a kid traveling from New York to Atlanta to go to my aunt and uncle's house um, for Passover every year and always carrying the banjo case with us that was, you know, held together with Delta fragile tape because the case was so old. So, I mean, my father, uh, you know, my father continued to play music until the end. I mean, he eventually found, you know, percussion and uh, found, found the drums, but, um, but, you know, even as, even as, you know, my father's uh, illness increased, you know, my wife, Jenna, and I would go over and see him and, and play the ukulele for him and, you know, see him smile and just the joy that music brought into his life. So that was there forever with him. Yeah. Well, um, you know, we, we have a few minutes, so I thought maybe I'd get your, everybody's re uh, take on Judah Benjamin. Um, you know, what is it about Judah Benjamin you think that appealed to Eli Evans, and why did he write this book? And uh, what is what is y'all's take on it? You know, I, I will say, uh, for, for my part, having studied Judah Benjamin myself, um, you know, he was he certainly, from the standpoint of Southern Jewish history, is the largest figure who looms over the whole field. So naturally, Eli would would want to write about him. I think Eli um, my my, my, Eli and I discussed this several times. I think he tried to make him more Jewish than he really was. But, um, you know, he, he, he strives in the book to uh, connect as much as he can uh, Judah Benjamin with, with Judaism. How do you think this book is going to stand up uh, in, uh, in, in 2022? Marcy? You mean it. 
I, I think that book is going to stand up just fine. Um, and I can't remember if it's been reprinted again or not. Yeah, but I, a, a really, really important text. And I think you're exactly right, Robert, that, you know, this, he was such a significant mm -hmm. Jewish white Southerner. Right. And Eli was fascinated by, you know, by his, the power that he held you know, at a very liminal moment of, you know, really heightened anti-Semitism as we all see again today. And and also that figure, I mean, he doesn't talk about it, but you know, like the the white supremacy that that comes of that era mm -hmm. and and is is integrated into that era, you know, and here he is as this figure who is trying to negotiate and navigate, you know, who he is. Is he a white confed, you know, is he a white Confederate, a Southerner, a, a Jew? How is he understood? But you know, he he has incredible power, uh, and he, but he's also he's also white, walking a tight line and and negotiating. But you know, he was he was still looking for, or you know, he was still collecting letters and historical materials on uh, on Judah P. Benjamin up to up to the last months of his you know last year of his life. You, know, you can hardly you can hardly study, read, or write about Southern Jewish history without Judah Benjamin. He's the largest figure who who looms so large. Um, Lynn, uh, well, I was just going to say, I mean, Eli identified with um, uh, it, Judah Benjamin as a self exploration into Southern Jewish identity. Uh, in 1948, the United Daughters of the Confederacy in Charlotte uh, asked the two synagogues, the Jewish community to sponsor, co-sponsor a monument to Judah Benjamin in downtown Charlotte, where a Jewish merchant uh, had sheltered him when uh, Benjamin fled um, uh, Richmond. Uh, and they uh, willingly agreed to do so. The monument was defaced during the Black Lives Movement. And now uh, the rabbi at one of the synagogues began using it for a lecture on uh, slavery, and now the synagogues have sponsored a petition uh, to have it removed, which it has been. Yeah. So mm -hmm. our understanding of, uh, I mean, I, I noticed that, for example, today, if we were to do an interview with Thomas Jefferson Tobias, would we ask him about his family's slaveholding legacy? Right. Um, mm -hmm. Would we uh, remark uh, about, uh, uh, not comment about a Jew who had written with Nathaniel Bedford Forrest, the founder of the Ku Klux Klan, or would we have been bemused to get a standing of, uh, ovation at a meeting of the United Daughters of the Confederacy? So I don't know, uh, I never really sp spoke to Eli about that, but you know, we, we kind of have a different evolving view of, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're deconstructing Confederate monuments at the moment. So whether Benjamin himself needs to be deconstructed uh, uh, in terms of the Jewish pride that we've had in him. Yeah. Steve, any thoughts on Judah Benjamin? Uh, yes, yeah, just very briefly. I agree with you, Robert, that the, uh, the authorial purpose was somehow to make uh, Jewishness and Southerness as compatible as it could be. Right. But I have to say, although it's an admirable book in all sorts of ways, uh, it's very well researched. It is, uh, it seems to me, weakened by the, the need to extract every ounce, every drop of Jewishness right. uh, from Judah P. Benjamin's sensibility and career. It's not particularly persuasive in that respect. And I think uh, in that sense, it's, uh, it's not really a satisfactory book. And to my best of my knowledge, it has not really been incorporated into Southern historiography in the way that the provincials was. Yeah. It's again a kind of personal, what, what would you want to call it, a personal biography, right. uh, just as uh, uh, the provincials was a personal history. Well, you know, I had a conversation with Eli in which um, he said, well, I saw you disagreed with some of my findings about Judah Benjamin. I said, well, you want Judah Benjamin to be Mutt Evans. I said, that's the problem with the book. I said, you want him to be, to be a proud Jew. I said, he's really more like my father, you know, who... Uh, could take it or leave it. So we were kind of laughing about that. Um, well, are there any other comments about, uh, about uh, I'll, I'll, I'll just make one um, because I put him on this book tour and we went to a bunch of places. 
So number one, the book is an incredible, um, insightful look into Judah Benjamin. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think the overall thing is, is that we all wanted him. We all wanted Judah Benjamin to be Jewish more than Jew, more than Judah Benjamin wanted to be seen as Jew. <laughs> right, right, right. And also, and also, I think, I think, you know, it's my take on Judah Benjamin is, is that when, when the Jews in the South who desperately wanted to assimilate uh, throughout Southern history, um, so they they wanted to see Judah Benjamin as a hero when Confederate leaders were heroes. Now, you know, there's a new biography of Benjamin that was just published by Yale University Press, and uh, you know, uh, you know, it, it was some pretty tough going there. I mean, Judah Benjamin not only was a slave owner and a plantation owner, but I mean, he ran a, a pretty brutal sugar plantation, which is the worst kind of slavery. So, I mean, it, it uh, you know, I think Judah Benjamin is going to, as all history does, reflects the current time. Well, I don't know where we stand, Rachel, on questions from the audience or time. Or we had we one are. more. There was one question that we'll bring it to a close. There was a question from someone asking, did um, Eli have a relationship with Harry Golden, the other Tory healed? Anyone? Marcy, Lynn, anybody do we know? Macy? Well, so I had Harry Golden in his latter days come to do a scholar in residence weekend, and Eli helped me get to him. Okay. Um, well, Harry Golden has mentioned, you know, it's funny you said that because he's mentioned uh, throughout the provincials, um, mm -hmm. Southern Jews in crisis. He talks about, um, he, he's got, um, Harry Golden was an exception, freewheeling and original, exuberant and perceptive. He came to the South in his late thirties and adopted it as his home. So he wrote about Harry Golden. So he must have known him, obviously, and had a relationship with him. Um, well, um, Jay, where- uh, We're gonna close, Robert. Yeah, I, we yeah. Wanted, to, wanted to stay within our time parameters. I wanna thank that. all the speakers and everybody. And um, I think, I wanna congratulate all of us. I think we just did a wonderful job. So thank you. I, uh, yes. You took the words right out of your mouth. You did. Uh, I. <laughs> <laughs> I have told my Southern Jewish Historical Society colleagues every time I listen to them talk, Macy, I would include you in that. <laughs> I feel like I'm getting a master's thesis on Southern Jewish history. Um, we can go on, and I wish we could. Um, we promised an hour-ish. Um, everyone, I'm Jay Silverberg. I'm president, uh, privileged to be president of the Southern Jewish Historical Society. Um, and just briefly want to close by saying Eli Evans touched all of us, whether we knew him personally or through the legacy he left us. Um, uh, I never met the man. Uh, I did briefly once, but uh, he never once ceased to reply or have his assistant get back to me to give me whatever information I needed. And I knew he was very busy. And this member of the Southern Jewish Historical Society bothering him. Um, but he would spend the time. And that's the Eli Evans, I think we all know. I just want to thank, uh, again, our panel, most of whom I will see in about a week in Charleston during the Society's annual conference, uh, certainly to our co-sponsors, the Jewish Historical Society of South Carolina, and my good friend, Rachel Barnett, whom I've never met personally, but will soon, uh, the American Jewish Historical Society, Gemma Birnbaum for being the wizard behind the curtain today, to the Institute of the Southern Jewish Life, and to the Covenant Foundation, and to all of you who spent a part of your Sunday with us, I want to close with these words that Eli wrote in 1976 in an essay published in a book titled Turn to the South. If you can find it on Amazon, I would suggest you buy it. It's a wonderful book. This is from Eli Evans. Southern Jewish history is alive and unfolding. The search is on not only for what happened, but for what people felt, hoped, feared. Jews in the South, Southern Jews, Jewish Southerners interlaced and intermingled, a prism to re-experience Southern history, to explore and discover these new participants in the Southern drama, an exciting and vital part of the Jewish experience in America. Shalom, y'all. We'll see you next time. Thank you. Thanks, thanks everyone.